Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Improving's Lunch and Learn. Before we get started, I want to inform you about a feature in the presentation that will make this session more interactive. So please take note of the question mark icon in the upper right-hand corner of the presentation screen. Clicking that icon will open the question and answer feature, which will allow you to send questions. So please post your questions as soon as you think of them so that we can get them and answer them at the appropriate time. Without further ado, we're excited to have Kevin Foster, senior Kevin. consultant with, uh, sorry, sorry, Nathan <laughs> Foster, senior consultant with- My friends with call me Nathan, Max. <laughs> yeah. With, uh, he'll be sharing with us Excel tips and tricks, uh, digging a little deeper. Nathan, sorry, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Max. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for sharing your lunch hour uh, with us today. Uh, as Max said, Nathan Boster giving a little talk on Excel tips and tricks. I am a senior consultant with Improving in the Atlanta office. Uh, I've been with Improving as long as there's been an Improving Atlanta, which is about two and a half years. And uh, I'm a data developer, database developer, but I'm always excited when I get a chance to work in Excel because uh, I just love that program. Super powerful, at times super easy, a great mix. So I'm looking forward to telling you more about uh, the cool tricks I have learned in my years of working with Excel. I got to that. Um, I'll have this slide at the end as well, but just uh, wanted to let you know where you can reach me. Uh, I don't tweet a whole lot, so follow me and you won't get uh, full of extra tweets. I promise that. And um, one of the fun rules about the company is be yourself. And since I'm a huge board game nerd, I always let that uh, nerd flag fly. And so if you're also on BoardGameGeek.com, then reach out to me there too. Uh, we'll compare um, uh, board game collections. And if yours is better than mine, I'll become your best friend. No presentation about Excel and digging deeper, uh, becoming an expert about Excel should skip over the, the, the easiest way to get efficient, and that is with the keyboard shortcuts. The Microsoft developers have taken the time to put a ton of keyboard shortcuts into Excel, and the more of them you learn, the faster you're going to get. In fact, I like to challenge myself to how much can I do in this little Excel project I have to do today? How much can I do without touching the mouse? And thanks to those developers, the answer is quite a bit. Of course, you're not going to memorize that crazy string of letters and numbers. Uh, so when you get the deck, you'll see that link to the keyboard shortcuts in Excel page at support.microsoft.com. I am going to be barely scratching the surface of what you're going to find on that page, so feel free to dig in uh, later. Uh, I start with the shortcuts for navigating. I'm not going to show you an example of each one of these because I want to get to the meatier stuff uh, in the presentation later, but if there's any of these that you didn't know about, then I highly recommend you go ahead and memorize them. Uh, terribly helpful, especially control page up and page down, which will move you from worksheet to worksheet within your workbook, and alt page up and page down, which actually within a worksheet, hitting alt and then page down, instead of going down, it'll go to the right. So it's kind of a neat way to jump a screen at a time to the right inside your worksheet. Um, usually, I can't think of any exceptions right now, if you combine the shift key with any of this moving around that you're doing, the shift key will also cause selection to occur. I think we're all used to this. I mean, you hold down shift and you press up, down, left or right, and the selection grows by that cell or that row. The same thing when you're jumping around with control and uh, these buttons. Hold down shift, you're going to get select also. Um, some other personal favorites, I truly, I just dug through that page at support.microsoft.com and said, I use that one a lot. I use that one a lot. I love telling people about that one. And that's how I came up with this page. Uh, right off the bat, my two favorites, control, shift. Well, it says shift. 
it's the control and the plus sign. If you're using your number pad, of course, you don't have to hit shift. But if you're using the key that's just to the left of backspace, then you are going to have to use shift because it's listening for the plus sign, not the equal sign. But control plus and control minus are like insert and delete without even having to right click. So I use those all the time. You can throw in date and time. You can open up the format cells dialog window with control one instead of right click and format or digging through the ribbon. Um, and also control and shift uh, separately with the space bar. Shift and space bar selects the entire row that you're on. Control and space bar selects the entire column that you're in. And even if you have a few, like if you have a few cells highlighted uh, from left to right, and then you hit control space bar, all of those columns will be selected. So it's a great way to quickly select a bunch of columns and then do a delete or an insert. Um, at the bottom are some things I'm going to show off just real quick in a second, so I'm not going to read through them, but control shift and one, two, three. If you look it up, you'll see control plus shift plus like one through eight or one through nine all do different formatting things and control shift L is a quick way to bring up the filter. So let's take a look at a spreadsheet that I have that's just great for moving around. Um, and let's just go right into the quick number formats that I was talking about. Uh, so we've got a boring format here. It's just, I mean, there's some of these decimals have one place, some of them have two. If I were to hit uh, control shift one after selecting this column. Oh my gosh, right after, pardon me for a second. This is behind the scenes editing for which I apologize. And I don't know where it went. When that happened, uh, it showed me that I still had zoom it. And I don't see it, so that's weird. So I'll just talk about it instead of t uh, showing you. I apologize for that. Control shift one would cause this uh, format. It's the basic number format with commas and two decimal places. Um, control shift four and what's on the four, but the dollar sign, so that helps you remember, gives you the nice currency format. Throws a dollar sign on the front, has that funny padding or whatever on the right, and so be it. Control shift five, the key with the percent sign on it, guess what? Turns that column into the percent format or percentage format. Um, and then, you know, you probably know by now how to increase and decrease decimal points uh, at will. Uh, let me also real quick bring up Control Shift L. I love this one for pull for enabling filter. So instead of jumping up here and then hitting this, Control Shift L gives you all of those little upside down triangles that you're used to on each uh, column. And if I just want to look at Angola, uh, it's just that simple. Control Shift L also disables it. So if I hit it again, I'm back to no more triangles and all the data still sitting right there. Um, so let's jump back into this. Ah, OK, so. When did the ribbon come out? I want to say it was like Office 2007. And not long, you know, remember everybody complaining about it. If you were if you were using Microsoft stuff in 2007, you heard the whining and moaning about the ribbon taking up so much space. Well, they did something that completely justifies the ribbon in my mind, and that is they made it completely discoverable via hotkeys. Hitting Alt, the top picture is what happens to your ribbon if you hit the Alt key while you're uh, in the in the spreadsheet. Uh, the first uh, the first time you hit Alt, you're going to get letters that show up underneath the different. I think they call it tabs of the ribbon: the File tab, the Home tab, the Insert tab. Uh, in the next picture, that's right after I hit the letter A. And so it jumped to the data tab and then showed me all of the keyboard shortcuts for that tab. 
Uh, I could quickly open up existing connections or I could quickly uh, look at recent sources by hitting P and then R. The ribbon is full of this alt key discoverability and it's incredible for even most uh, some of the stuff I used to do every day was just three key presses. Um, and since I did it every day, it was easy to remember what those key presses were. Not only did they do that, but then Microsoft went one step further and gave us what they called a quick access toolbar, which you see at the bottom of my screen. But if you were in Excel, you would see it in the upper left corner. Um, and it's very, very customizable. Pretty much every command that exists in any of those ribbon tabs you can put into your quick access toolbar and at first you're like oh that's great that means i i can go right to uh this button right here to remove duplicates instead of going to the data tab and then clicking on it but then they went one step even beyond that if i am in and i'll just show you because it's really cool let's jump back to this one i'm going to be in the country column if I hit Alt, not only do you see the keyboard shortcuts for the ribbon, but notice, and I hope my screen isn't like too big for the screen that you're that you're looking at right now. Notice the numbers that have popped up under the icons in my quick access toolbar. Uh, it's kind of hiding <laughs> what's there, but thankfully I know that if I hit five right now, I'm going to sort ascending the column that I'm in. If I were to hit Alt-6, I hit I am now sorting descending. Um, let's go over here to where there's some uh, decimal points. And if I remember correctly, it's Alt-8 and 9. Yes, it is. Alt-8 increases decimal points. No more looking around for this button right here. I've got it on Alt-8 and Alt-9. So if you haven't figured it out yet, I am a keyboard shortcut nerd. I love them and uh, I love telling people about them. So the ribbon and the quick access toolbar, learn it, live it, love it. Back into PowerPoint. Okay, so we're done talking about a bunch of stuff around Excel. Let's do something in it. The fill handle is this little square, uh, actually I can zoom in because I accidentally have zoom in. That black square or dark green or whatever it is in the lower left corner of the selected cell. It's called a fill handle, F-I-L-L, -L, and it does all kinds of cool stuff. Patterns, I'm gonna talk about patterns, autofill and flash fill. Uh, if you have a day of the week or a day of the month, or a date, as you see there on row two, and you start with that value and use the fill handle to drag down, Excel recognizes what you're doing and says, oh, you want days of the week. Or Excel says, oh, I see, you want months of the year. Or even incrementing by one day, and we're gonna go from March 15th down to April 13th. Incredible. I love this. Now, just so you know, there actually is a way to override that. Let's say for some reason, I actually need the word April for some number of rows. As I pull down, and I hope you can see this because it's kind of small, the tooltip is showing me the names of the months. You know, if I stopped right there, I would see October. If I hold down control, see how it changed to April? And now I get April all the way down by holding down the control key. So it's a nice little override for the default functionality of the fill handle. Uh, you can also set up patterns and Microsoft, excuse me, Excel will see what you have done and continue the pattern as far as you drag. So here I have started uh, putting in values, uh, uh, values of five, excuse me, multiples of five. What's Excel gonna do? You guessed it, it's gonna keep building a list by fives. Even works with decimal points. Now I've got a whole list um, that went by tenths of a point. Now, um, 
hopefully maybe one or two of you have seen the movie that I'm referencing uh, with this silly little text here. But what I'm showing off is that this is a pattern that's not really a normal pattern. It's not 5, 10, 15, 20. It's not the days of the week and stuff. But I've selected all of it, and now I'm going to use the fill handle. And so Excel is going to say, I don't know what you're talking about, but I will show you that, you know, six or seven. What is it? I'll, I'll show you those seven values over and over again because that's what you told me you wanted to do. So um, I'll show you guys later how I used that to help with another example um, uh, example list. So there is a use for that. Let's jump in and see here. We go all right, right into autofill. OK, so back to autofill. All right, I have three different lists because I want to show you uh, three slightly different ways that autofill understands what you want it to do. If I click on Fred here in column B, it's at the top of a list of data. And in a sense, all that data, what it, what it actually is, doesn't matter. But Excel simply sees that I have, um, I've selected the top cell of, you know, nine or 10 values. If I double click on the fill handle, the word Fred is not a formula. So it just says, oh, you want me to copy down and I will stop when I get to the end of the list. Oh, very nice. And now all those Barneys have become Fred's. It also works if there's nothing under Fred, but Fred is next to a list that 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 goes further than column F in this case. The fill handle when double clicked will go will say, oh, I'll repeat this value until I run out of data in the column to the left of where I am. So and now there's a Fred for every Barney. Uh, but it didn't change because Fred is not a formula. It's just the word. Here we have a formula. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this aspect. When I double click, um, the formula is copied down. And so I have multiples of two because I was uh, multiplying column I to column J. So neat little things to know about autofill. But one of the neatest things I have learned about Excel in the past few months has to be this flash fill stuff. First, I'm going to show you kind of a neat Excel guessing what you want to do and suggesting a completion for you. And then I'm going to show you flash fill using the fill handle and it's also pretty slick. So over here on these uh, list of cast members from Oceans 11, if I start typing, if I type Matt Damon, and then as I start typing Brad Pitt, Excel says, I think I see what you're doing. You're combining the column, the column A with column B with a space in the middle. Is this what you want? And I can hit enter and it finishes it for me. So I was messing with this and I thought, OK, how? complicated can my patterns get? Can I use different um, uh, characters? Let's see what happens. So this value right here, I typed it. It's not a uh, concatenation. It's not a formula. And I had to make sure that I typed it correctly. You know, triple A and then I wanted an underscore and then I had to type the ticket number correctly so that Excel would see the pattern and then a dash and then the word dev and then a colon and then the developer's name. Now, when I double click, because this isn't a formula, Excel is going to say, oh, you want that value all the way down until you know the column next to it stops. Well, not exactly true, but I solved that by clicking on this little options uh, box at the bottom. And when I say, no, what I actually wanted was flash fill, Excel says, oh, OK, well, I see the pattern that you did in I2, and I'll just continue that pattern all the way down. And uh, in my imagination, uh, column I was the way I wanted this data formatted for emails I was going to send out or something like that. But I was I was impressed with Excel being able to pick up on the pattern I created, uh, even with different uh, uh, all kinds of different characters, more than just a space between names. I thought that was pretty awesome. 
So fill handle. Paste special. Yes, that's right. All righty, so let me find my paste special. I'm going to skip paste special values because I bet you already know about that. But have you ever tried using operation or transpose? I think those are worth showing off. So we'll go right into the operation uh, worksheet here. And the best example, fake example I could think of is, let's say the boss doesn't want to see percent signs in column G. So the percentage format isn't what the boss wants. He wants to see literally 60.1 or 32.9. So, okay, I mean, you could, you could like, you could like make a, a column right here that was all of those things time, times 100 and then copy and paste it back. But check out this cool little paste special operation. I'm going to take the value 100. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to select all of these. Choose paste special and under operation, I'm going to include choose multiply. And then I'm also going to get rid of a lot of these extra decimals. And now we have what the boss wanted. Uh, integer, not integer, but you know, non-decimal, uh, non-percentage sign values in this column and did it all at once using paste special operation. Paste special transpose is also just a great little trick to have in your toolkit. You never know when you might need it. Transpose simply takes the rows and turns them into columns or the columns and turns them into rows. So I actually want this data set with uh, uh, months down in a column and the values right next to it. So I copy it, paste special, transpose, and my rows have turned into columns. Uh, if I copy and do it again, it would turn back into rows. However, I want to just show some, something real quick. These paste options that are in the right click menu, if you leave your mouse over them, Excel will actually show you what you're about to do if you were to click on it. So I think that's a cool little feature to be aware of. And for the heck of it, I'm transposing back. Uh, paste special. Now that I have a moment, uh, taking a moment to catch my breath, uh, as suggested, please, 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 uh, let's make this as interactive as possible. If there's any questions you have or uh, things you think you might want to see, throw them up in that QA uh, area, I believe, to the upper right. I can't see it, but I'm sure you can. Okay, here is, here is actually my absolute favorite. Control plus the Enter key when you are finished with whatever you are doing inside a cell. The Microsoft definition on that page I told you about with the keyboard shortcuts is fill the selected cell range with the current entry. What does that mean? If you use control enter instead of just enter, any cells you have selected, the same thing will happen in all of those cells. Let me show you. Let's jump into where to go, where to go. Ah, oh, perfect. Ignore that uh, table of values for a second. Let me just show you basic control, uh, control enter. Uh, let's select some stuff. You know, I just use shift to select some more stuff and then I'm going to select some one at a time using the control, uh, control key plus the mouse. We've all done this before. Now I'm done. I'm going to start typing something. Could be a value, could be just a string, whatever. And I'm going to hold down control and hit enter. Every cell that was selected now has the same thing. Oh, that's neat. It was really neat at my old job when I always seemed to have pivot tables that gave me data like this. Pivot tables that gave me blanks when there was nothing for that month in that category, for example. So do I want to select, you know, if you if all you've learned is what I've told you today, you know that you could select each of these um, blanks 
and then type zero and hit control enter. But there's another thing that I pretty much always use at the same time that I'm using control enter, which is going to blow your mind. I'm going to select the range, all that table. I'm going to go up to find and select. I'm going to click go to special and this this dialog box right here is worth knowing about for several reasons. Formulas, uh, region, objects, data validation, visible, really cool. I love the blanks option. So in the region I have just selected, go to all the blanks. There you go. I press zero, I press control enter. And now I don't have any holes in my data table anymore. The other place where this was huge for me was uh, I would often create pivot tables and then send the data copy and pasted uh, to other people in the company. They didn't need a pivot table. They just needed the, the slim down results of the pivot table I had created. So I would like copy this whole pivot table. I would paste special values on this screen. Uh, what happens if you copy a pivot table and then just paste it? You have another pivot table. So when you're doing this, I would always paste special and just show the values. This is neat, but if if the person I'm sending it to ever wants to sort by column A or column B, that's not going to go well because of all these blanks. So I use control down arrow to go to the end of the range. And then I'm just I'm going to select a few cells, but then I'm going to hit uh, I'm going to hold shift while hitting control home. And I go all the way up to line two. And that's simply because uh, you may have noticed uh, with the slightly darker line there on the, at the bottom of row one. I have frozen the first uh, row and so control home doesn't take you to A1. In this case, it takes you to A2. So I've selected everything in a columns A and B all the way down to the end of my list. I use my favorite little trick again. Go to special blanks. Now what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to use a formula. I'm going to say equals then i'm going to use the up arrow and it just so happens that i'm sitting in b3 so up arrow gives me b2 but really what is it doing it's actually as we all know because of we know the difference between relative and absolute references it's saying the cell above the relationship between b3 and b2 is b2 is just one above it so when i hit control enter Every blank cell that I had selected now says, we'll just use the value of the cell above it. And so it's all filled in now. The region is filled in, all the countries are filled in. Now, don't hand it over just yet because uh, the vast majority of uh, column A and column B are now formulas. So we're gonna select them, copy them, and pay special values. And now they actually have the word. Hey, Nathan, real quick. Could you uh, just give, uh, we got a question that came in. Just a quick brief intro into a pivot table. Hi, Mike, somebody, uh, somebody out there is reading my mind or has skipped ahead. Uh, this, excuse me, I should have jumped back here to show you this page. This is how you get, if you're trying to remember later, this is how you get to the blanks. And then the next screen after that is Let's talk about pivot tables for just a second. Uh, pivot tables could be their own hour long presentation easily. They are that powerful. The fact that they come inside a piece of software that costs 100 bucks a year or something like that borders on the ridiculous. Pivot tables are awesome. If you are very comfortable with pivot tables already, thank you very much. Um, give us just a second to talk to those who aren't. If you are not comfortable or not familiar with pivot tables yet, there is a highly recommended suggestion. In my horribly unscientific um, opinion, I think of all the people in the world that use Excel on a regular basis, I think the percentage of those people who know pivot tables is less than half and could be close to just a quarter. So, 
giving yourself a little bit of a tutorial on pivot tables is a huge step in becoming the Excel expert at the office or one of the Excel experts at the office. So I had a data table just chock full of fake sales data. Um, I hit control A to select the whole thing. I like to deal with named ranges. It is entirely possible to start a pivot table and just and then just jump to the other worksheet and select everything you want. But I selected this whole data set and I came up here and I gave it the name table data. So then when I came to uh, when I jumped into this worksheet up in the first uh, cell, I said, give me a pivot table and the data is inside TBL data. And I said, OK, no problem. And it actually looked like this at first. This is what you get when you first open a pivot table. So then you start slicing and dicing. Well, I know I want breakdown by region and country. Now, what do I want? Do I want unit cost? You can use formulas inside here to do stuff like this. Let's just go with a, an easy one and say total revenue. No, sorry, total profit. So now I have the total profit for each country in each region. Um, you know, let's break it down one more. Uh, you can, I'm not going to go through it, but you could, of course, change the format of column C. Um, it wouldn't be nice to have uh, uh, commas and stuff. But let's break it down a little bit more. Let's go by item type. Well, now we're looking at Bangladesh in Asia, but we're looking at the different categories, baby food, beverages, cereal, and the total profits there. And then it's like, well, wait a minute. I just actually, let's just see how cosmetics are doing in each country. So we go over here to this filter arrow and I just want to see cosmetics. Uh, it's still grouped by region still showing me by country. Um, and in fact, uh, because of my prep beforehand, I have turned off things like subtotals and grand totals. Uh, those are really easy ways. Let's see here, just real quick. Subtotal at the bottom of a group. OK, so this is kind of why I turn it off. So it's showing me at the bottom of each country what's going on. Uh, since I have just one item type, it's not terribly useful. But if we jump down, I have the total for all the countries that we do business with in Asia. And if I jump a little further, then I've got Australia and Oceania. Um, and all of that is controllable in this pivot table design uh, ribbon tab up here. Um, it has been too long since I have done any fancy calculations inside a pivot table, like a calculated column or I think it's called a calculated measure, but don't quote me on that. Let it be known that this is scratching the surface of pivot tables. If there's something that you have just seen that you're like, wait a minute, Excel can do that, then dive in. There is a ton of great uh, tutorials and stuff out there to, to help you become very adept at pivot tables. Incredible. Less briefly than I was expecting, but that's OK. <laughs> um, I'm not going to show you VLOOKUP. If you're on this, if you're in this presentation and you don't know VLOOKUP, right after it's over, go look up VLOOKUP. It's just like it's, you know, those letters VLOOKUP, L-O-O-K-U, L-O-O-K-U-P. I'm going to assume the vast majority of you know what a VLOOKUP can do. But there's an even neat, even uh, more powerful way to do lookups using the index function and the match functions put together. So I'm going to jump into index and match. So index, excuse me. No, yeah, let's start there. Index takes one or two uh, it takes a, uh, the first argument is the uh, data range. The second argument has to do with the row you want um, the row down that you want index to look for. So if you want to look at want it to look at the third row, then it's index. Well, let me show you right here. It's index the range and then a three. But there's a, you can put in one more 
uh, parameter, one more argument for the index function, and then it will move over in columns. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to show what happens, you know, a fake sales report here. I want to see how well Matt Damon did in March. Well, I can type Damon, his last name, and March, the abbreviations for the months, and it shows me 67652. Is that right? Yes, it is. Because this is almost doing like a two dimensional lookup. It's looking in column A to uh, using the match function to find. Um, OK, so look at the formula match whatever is in I2, which is where I put Matt's last name and then look through A2 through A10, which is the orangish reddish and uh, zero means um, exact match. If you have nothing there for that zero or you have a one, then it'll do approximate matching, which is cool in some cases, but not what I wanted to do now. And Damon is the seventh item in that range. MAR is the third item in the green range from B1 over to F1. And so if I want Matt Damon's sales from March, then in the blue area, I want to go down seven to get to Damon, and then I want to go to the third column to get to March, and that's what I have, 67652. One really cool thing about March that's very different than uh, uh, what you're going to find in VLOOKUPs is notice that my column A is not alphabetic. Uh, it's it's looking for Damon and it doesn't it doesn't care that the column is not alphabetically sorted. So that's that could be very important later if you've got a situation where you can't for some reason alphabetically sort something, then index and match put together uh, might be the way to go. And so this formula is where I used um, all three. I used both functions um, without any shortcuts. Uh, so I used index, selected the range I wanted, and then used match to deal with the names, the salesperson names, and then used another match to deal with the months. Um, and this, forgive me, is just scratching the surface of index and match put together. Um, those of you who know vertical lookup, uh, V lookup, know that uh, when you use it, you're only going to be able to pull back stuff that's to the right of the first column uh, or the first column um, from the range that you're looking into. But there are ways to use index and match so that no matter what column you start with, you can work to the right or to the left to pull back the other value you want. Um, there's and then you know you get into even crazier stuff if you don't use a zero as the third argument for match. If you want to do some approximating, uh, then you know there's a whole another uh, area that that is blown wide open. So um, vertical lookup, V lookup is incredible. Works almost all the time. When you need something a little uh, more complicated, but a little a lot more powerful, index and match put together is your answer. So um, hey, Nathan, we had a question that came in. I think um, fits well here. Uh, that, so they put, so when you type equal match, the formula pops up? Yes, let's go ahead and just do it right down here. Equal match. If you uh, see here, this, why do I not talk about this for a second? Thank you, whoever brought this up. As you start typing a function name after you uh, started with the equal sign, um, this neat little filter of choices starts happening. So what I'm going to hit right now is tab, and it takes care of the opening um, parentheses, parentheses for me, and I hope you can see it again with the way screens work. You, it might be very small on your screen. I apologize. But now it's kind of helping me out. It's like, okay, what's the lookup value? What is it that you want me to match? Well, okay, I want you to find the word Damon. And then I hit comma. And now the little function helper has lookup array highlighted. 
oh yeah, that's the range where I want you to look for the word daemon. And it just happens to be this area over here. Then a comma again. And then match type is in square brackets, which means that that argument is optional. But the default is one, which is approximate matching. That's not what I want. So I'm going to hit zero. And I'm going to close the parenthesis. Now I have the right answer. Damon is the seventh value in that red range starting at the top and counting down. Uh, I did something similar with March, except of course there the range is left to right, and so match starts at the left and just goes looking and returns back the mm, returns back the number of the item uh, where it sits in that series. Um, and then index, actually what I, like I said, what I told it to do was, I, here's something very important. The index range, if you can see it, hopefully it's B2 to F10. I don't want to include the row columns or that, uh, excuse me, the column headers or that extra column over to the left. I just want my data set uh, or else your, uh, your seven and three is going to be a bit messed up uh, when it when the index goes looking for it. But with Damon and March, it's seven and three. So if we start in B2, we go down seven. That's right, that's Damon. We go over to the third value. That's the 6752. I hope that's what they were asking. <laughs> and, and I'm glad they asked because it brought up a great thing. Use that formula autocomplete, I don't know, or function autocomplete. I don't know what Microsoft calls it, I apologize. But think of it as function autocomplete. You can just start typing. Um, I use it all the time. I make these, uh, these data tables by using a cool little function called rand between, or it, I call it random between, but that's not how it's spelled. But I just start typing it and I can stop after the B because that's the only function that starts with R-A-N-D-B. I hit tab and I say, I want values from 10 to 1,000. And then what do I do? I hit Control Enter. If I hit Enter, I'd only be dealing with E13, but I hit Control Enter and I get uh, the whole data range, the whole selection range filled in because of that special Control Enter functionality. Hey, Nathan, real quick, I kind of in that backing up a little bit. What if there were multiple daemons in the result set? Then I think, well, a couple things. Nope, there's not a starting from like there is with find. I think you might be out of luck in that regard. So similar to VLOOKUP, you're going to want to make sure that what you're matching if this is the purpose, that what you're matching can hit a unique value. Because I'm pretty sure it's just going to stop at daemon, uh, at the first daemon that it finds. The, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I've, uh, I've got an idea, but I'm going to, I'm not going to bore anybody with it unless it comes up. Because <laughs> the, there are some functions where, um, one of the arguments is starting number like you're looking for something and you're looking for certain text inside a cell and you actually don't have to make the function start at the very first uh, character you can give it a starting number and then that find function will start there and then look to the right uh, that's convenient I, i've I wish I, had, I wish I could quickly throw one together uh, to show you its convenience, but I don't want to do that much typing in front of, in in the middle of a, uh, a presentation. We all know right. that is tempting fate. We had another one kind of came in that's along that. So does VLOOKUP have to be a unique value as well? Yes, because you're going to VLOOKUP will stop looking when it finds the first match. Um, let's see, I don't have a VLOOKUP real quick. And 
if I'm not mistaken, there is not a starting number helper argument inside VLOOKUP. So yeah, that's going to happen as well. So both in VLOOKUP and in match, you're going to want to make sure you're dealing with unique values. So somebody posted here, and I don't know if this is where your mind was going, but they said, you know, uh, in real scenarios that I have, I'll use sum if or average if to get that unique value. OK, so. But what they're doing, and, and hopefully he'll correct me if he or she will correct me if I'm wrong, some if and average if are fantastic. Uh, if you have a bunch of Damons and a bunch of Cheetles and a bunch of Afflecks and so on, but you just want uh, Matt Damon's values, then some if is going to give you the sum based upon a criteria that you put right into the function. Average if is going to give you an average. Um, I'm trying to think of how I could, would combine that with a VLOOKUP. Now I'm looking forward to this person's lunch and learn uh, because yeah. I want to I want to see how <laughs> I bet that just off the top of my head, I bet there probably is something pretty slick with vertical lookup combined with some if or average if so I might very, I might very, dig into that over the weekend. <laughs> very good, very good. Thank you. So my family thanks you for giving me another thing to dig into that's not uh, playing with them. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And we are we're getting close to the end. Um, how many questions right now? Is it are we question free at the moment, Max? Yeah, yes, we are. OK, then I'm going to try and do something real fast. I've set up most of it. it it's something I've been doing with Excel for a while, and I, I love how nerdy it is. I'm going to actually have to didn't know if I'd have time for it, so I left it alone. Uh, I didn't even open it to begin with. It's going to show I'm going to be showing you uh, a cool Windows Explorer trick, a couple of neat Excel functions. And then if you're unfamiliar with batch files in Windows, then if you try this at home, please proceed with caution. But there's only about a billion websites out there that will help you uh, understand batch files. It's something that's been with Windows for 100 years now. Um, so I wanted to create, I wanted to rename a bunch of screenshots. All the screenshots had this boring, had these boring names, screenshot, date, and time. Woohoo. These are the remember how I said I was a board game nerd. This is me playing my friend Ed and uh, just obliterating him at the online version of Through the Ages, excuse me, the app mobile app version of Through the Ages. And because I'm a board game nerd, I take screenshots of that screen at the end of all the games that I play. But I don't I don't want to save it as just screenshot. I want to quickly rename all of those files. And I know there's a rename ability inside uh, a little bit baked into Windows, but I have all kinds of control and options if I do it inside or if I do it using Excel. So the, uh, the, the value, the string right above where I've selected is a command line that if I was in that folder, if I was in that directory and I opened up the command prompt for Windows and I ran that, uh, executed that string, it would rename that one file into through the ages 2021.06.001. But if I make a batch file out of a whole bunch of those commands, then I can change all of those file names in half a second. Uh, the first thing I have to do is, no, sorry. The first thing I have to do is I have to get these file names into Excel, and there's an awesome Windows trick that not a lot of people know about. In Windows Explorer, if you select one or more, and it doesn't have to be contiguous like this, it works if I use the control key and did this, but I want everything. If you select files in Windows Explorer, and you hold down the shift key when you right click. There's this cool option called copy as path. Uh, I used to use this all the time when I had to take a text file and put its file path into the import wizard for SQL Server or something like that. Use it all the time. Uh, if I hit paste, this is what 
the uh, result looks like. I have the full file path of every file I just had selected. I lop off the quotation marks because I don't need them and put it into Excel, but I still don't want um, I, I still don't want all this extra stuff. I just want to rename the file name. So if anybody has used mid, uh, the mid function, you tell it, you tell Excel where to start and you tell it grab all the characters from this starting point through uh, this far. And I just use the word, the letter, the number 100, because I know there's a lot less than 100 characters after where I wanted it to start. But that's like, OK, do I want to like count where the capital S and screenshot is? No, I don't want to count. I just want to use the find function. I said Excel find where capital S C R E begins inside cell A2 and give me that value. Oh, it's the 36th character in the string. Cool. So if I say Excel, Give me a mid from this cell, A2. Start at 36 and give me 100 characters. I get screenshot. I get just the file name. Let's use our auto hot. So then I also used uh, concatenation to create the new file names that I want. And concatenation can be done a couple ways. I like using ampersands with uh, double quotes to separate like values from strings. And then there's this cool little text function from Excel and the row function. I used row of A1 to just give me the number one, but when I copy down, it's gonna then give me A2 and A3 and A4. So it's always gonna give me a nice incremented number, but I wanted it to have leading zeros because as you, you, know, you can see what I want over on the right, uh, right uh, the rightmost column, the underscore underscore zero zero one dot PNG. So the text function, when you feed it a number or a date, the text function will look at the pattern that you give it inside the double quotes, in this case, the triple zero, and it will match, it'll take the number and make it match the pattern. Doing what I just did means Excel, take the number, and put leading zeros in front of it because I want it to be a string of three characters. So if it's the number one, it's going to actually be a zero zero one. And then I use concatenation one more time with uh, starting with the capital R E N, which is the rename command in Windows batch files. So put it all together, use the autofill, excuse me, use the fill handle, which by the way, you don't have to use the fill handle one column at a time. I just selected three uh, cells worth of formulas. Double click. It stopped because here's the end of my um, uh, table. And now I have the commands that I put into a batch file. Batch files, if you're unfamiliar, need to end with the extension BAT. But if you right click on it and edit, It'll pop up in Notepad and I can see, oh yeah, that's what I wanted. Close that and then double click it. Do you guys see that flash? In about a tenth of a second, all of my files now have the file names I want for easy archiving in my board game nerd uh, folder full of finished online games. And with that, I don't have time for anything else except a few questions. <laughs> Nathan, that is that is very cool. Thank you. So, so yes, I, I, I know there are rename uh, apps out there in Excel. Excuse me, Windows kind of has one built in, but I love the control and optimiz uh, and uh, customization that I have doing this in Excel. Very cool. So, so yeah, one question uh, that we came in really, this is, uh, our last question as well is are there any resources that you're kind of the go to to get some of your information around uh, special features of Excel or whatnot? So, I mean, I know obviously Microsoft posts, you know, lots of videos and things like that. Do you find those to be valuable or do you tend to go somewhere else to find detailed information? I personally am not a 
usually a video learner. I like to just read it and try it, you know, have have the Microsoft page on one half of the screen and Excel in the other half and just follow along. So I can't, I mean, my gosh, I'm sure YouTube has uh, 100 billion uh, uh, Excel videos out there. I like going, when I'm first looking up a function I'm not familiar with or I haven't used in a while, I do like going straight to the source and looking it up in, in the Microsoft support pages. When I'm looking for, when I'm looking to solve a problem of mine in Excel, I'm, I, I usually hit uh, any results in Google that are from Excel Jet, Excel J-E-T, or MrExcel.com. Um, I don't mean to slight any others. I, I'm not making a judgment call, but I have, um, I have always been quite uh, happy with what I have found at ExcelJet.com and MrExcel.com, as well as, of course, the Microsoft Pages. Awesome. And for, we'll go one more question, the most important one. What is your, the latest hot board game that you like right now that you're, you've been playing? Uh, on the, does it, is he or she asking on the table or in the app? Table. Table. Uh, I just picked up the new one from Phil Walker Harding called Summer Camp. I uh, really enjoyed that with, uh, none of you uh, might know this, but uh, my wife and I have uh, seven kids and the youngest who played this game is only eight years old and she loved it. So I've got a great family game there in summer camp. Um, my wife and I are about to play our 100th game of Patchwork by Uwe Rosenberg. If you know board games, you know that guy's name. He did uh, Agricola, Caverna, um, La Havre. And Patchwork is, in my opinion, the best two player game on the market. If you're looking, if you have no idea what's out there in board games and you're looking for a board game to play with your spouse or significant other or whatever, and you need a two player game, get patchwork. If you don't like it, tell me and I will probably buy it from you and give it to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending today's uh, virtual lunch and learn. Uh, and Nathan, thank you for sharing uh, lots of great little nuggets inside of there. Max, um, thank you for producing. This has been a great yeah. experience. Awesome. Uh, just to remind everybody, the recording of this section, session will be available through Improving's website. So it's uh, improving.com forward slash virtual hyphen events. Um, or if you're on YouTube, you can just uh, uh, search for Improving Enterprises and you'll, you'll get to our YouTube page. But uh, I hope everybody has a great rest of your weekend. Have a good weekend, everybody.